Good evening. So far, the presidential primaries have focused more heat on the candidates than light on the issues. However, even name-calling can get you thinking. So tonight, prompted by an insult, we will think about food stamps and hunger. A couple of weeks before the Florida vote, Newt Gingrich labeled Barack Obama the food stamps president, adding this. The fact is that more people have been put on food stamps by Barack Obama than any president in American history. Now, I know among the politically correct, you're not supposed to use facts that are uncomfortable. But is President Obama the food stamp champ? We'll find out, then delve into the underlying issue of hunger and how to address it in New York. Next, we'll visit the digital branch of the main library, where you can cut up and fold New York's precious collection of rare old maps and see 3D from the 1880s. Also tonight, cramming for an A in Java, the high school for No Not Baristas, for budding computer programmers, that kind of Java. First, food stamps and hunger. Did you know that only over 46 million Americans get food aid under the SNAP program? That stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. That's one in seven of us on what used to be called food stamps. Did the increase to this astonishing fraction happen mostly under the Obama administration, as Newt Gingrich suggests? Let's ask Brooks Jackson, the director of factcheck.org, who joins us via Skype from his home in Maryland. Hello from New York, Brooks. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Brian. Good to be here. Well, did the uh, food stamp rolls increase more under President Obama than any other administration? No, not quite. The uh, increase started uh, long before Barack Obama took office. The numbers are, and we got these uh, from the Department of Agriculture, month-by-month -month figures, so we can make a precise uh, presidential terms. It's true, 14.2 million of that more than 46 million has come on since Barack Obama took office. But uh, George Bush beats him, 14.7 million went on during the eight years George Bush was president. Do you know why? Well, there are a number of reasons. I can tell you what the uh, Agriculture Department officials say. Um, there, uh, of course, has been a, a lot of changes going back to the 2002 agriculture bill. Um, food stamps are no longer food stamps. Uh, you now get, if you're uh, on this food aid, a plastic uh, credit card for all intents and purposes, which uh, can be used at the supermarket just like, just like a credit card. It may carry less stigma, may make people uh, a little less ashamed to sign up for food stamps. States are doing a lot more outreach than they used to. Um, Obama deserves uh, some of the responsibility, though. Um, the average benefit uh, has gone up under the uh, stimulus bill, about $80 a month for a family of four. Uh, and that's, uh, that increase under the stimulus bill is still in effect. And there's a slight easing of eligibility. It used to be that uh, if you were an able-bodied adult, and you were unemployed and had no dependents, you could get food stamps for only three months. Well, that was lifted uh, under the stimulus, and it's continued uh, under waivers for nearly all the states. Of the 46 million Americans on food stamps or SNAP or using the EBT cards, as they're called, do you know how many are working? How many are working? I don't have that number. I don't know. Um, with respect to Gingrich's language, some people have said that it's racial code because when he rails against food stamp dependency, he's talking mostly to angry white Americans who think of quote unquote welfare queens to go back to another era and people dependent on food stamps who are not like them, who are somehow mooching off the system, off their tax dollars. Uh, is there any way to fact check that? Well, uh, of course, I can't read Newt Gingrich's mind, uh, and there may be a, he may be um, exploiting public misconceptions here. 
But the best numbers on who actually gets food stamps probably come from the Census Bureau. They do a household survey, survey every year. Uh, the Department of Agriculture really doesn't know very accurately because they no longer require uh, the race question to be filled out. So the numbers they have, about 20% or so of people just don't answer that question. Census, however, uh, in its annual survey, says uh, last year something uh, less than 49% of food stamp recipients were white and not Hispanic. Uh, about 26 percent black, uh, about 20 some percent Hispanic, and the rest uh, of other races uh, or mixed race. Which is to say that blacks and Hispanics are overrepresented on the food stamp program compared to their percentage of the population, but then again, they're overrepresented as poor people in America. Well, I think you're absolutely correct about that. Um, the um, increase in the number of users is still pretty astonishing. Whether it started under Bush and continued on during the Great Recession under President Obama or got there some other way, 46 million Americans. So maybe Gingrich is right to some degree that we're living in a food stamp era when he would rather have us be living in a job growth era. Well, personally, I did find the number surprising. I uh, hadn't paid attention to it for that uh, for a while until we took a look at it. Uh, yes, it's about one in seven Americans now get uh, supplemental nutrition assistance, and uh, that is a pretty high level. Brooks Jackson. Now, it, it may have peaked, Brian. The uh, Say last, again? last figure we have is for October, and the number actually went down a little in October. That's not a trend, but if it becomes a trend, then we've seen the peak. Well, I think everybody of all political parties would probably agree that's good news if it means more people are earning more money, able to get more jobs or better jobs. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Now we have the facts straight. Let's move on. The food stamp program goes back more than 70 years. As you'll see in this film clip from a film called Making America Stronger, it was produced in 2007 by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities to celebrate the 30th anniversary of a major bipartisan expansion of food stamps back in 1977. That was when Congress, with the help of the press, got reawakened to hunger in America. Be aware as you watch this, parts of this four-minute excerpt might be painful to watch. Food stamps were first introduced to the American public as a pilot program during the Great Depression. Mabel McFiggin of Rochester, New York was the first food stamp recipient. She paid $4 and got $6 worth of stamps in return. An orange stamp could buy any food while a blue stamp was good for only what the Department of Agriculture deemed to be in surplus. That program lasted through the early 40s. Food stamps were revived in the 60s as part of the war on poverty, but Americans still had to pay for their stamp coupons, and for the poorest, that was a hardship. Many of us today probably don't remember the extreme poverty that existed in pockets of our country in the 1960s. We saw some many who died as a secondary consequence to severe malnutrition. Dr. Aaron Shirley was part of a team of doctors that investigated. You'd see skinny legs, uh, skinny arms, uh, shrunken facial features, and a bloated belly. And that's what really, really, uh, as a pediatrician, is what got my attention. The doctor's work became part of a CBS documentary hosted by Charles Kuralt called Hunger in America. This baby is dying of starvation. He was an American. Now he is dead. It shocked the American public. I was watching a documentary on CBS. It was 1968, and I remember saying, why are they looking at hunger in the United States? The incident in that documentary that caught my attention was they picked up on a little boy standing uh, along the side of the room, leaning against the wall. 
Well, when you get to school, what do you have to eat there? Yes. You don't have anything to eat when you're at school? Yes. Television interviewers said to this little boy, what do you think when you stand here day after day watching the other children eat and you can't join with them? He said, I'm ashamed. Be ashamed of me. Are you ashamed? Yes, be hard. Why are you ashamed? I don't have no money. I said to my family that were watching that documentary with me, you know, it's not that little boy who should be ashamed. It's George McGovern, a United States senator, a member of the Committee on Agriculture. So I went to the Senate the very next day and introduced a resolution to create what was the Select Committee on nutrition and human needs and for the next 10 years that committee led the way in this country in making sure every member of congress every american knew about hunger in this country bob dole was the ranking republican on the committee i was the chairman and we worked hand in glove we didn't play any partisan politics with this issue what really impressed me were the field hearings, and you saw it firsthand, and you knew it wasn't something that some network maybe dreamed up or whatever, found some isolated cases. I think we began to understand it was widespread, and it needed, needed to be addressed. There you go. That clip from the 2007 film, Making America Stronger. By the way, Bob Dole voted against food stamps as a congressman in the House, but as you saw, later became a champion of the program in the Senate. Food stamps help feed 1.8 million New Yorkers, but they are just one part of the system of supports that bring nutrition to hundreds of thousands here. The Food Bank for New York City studies the problem and delivers the goods. Its president and CEO, Margaret Purvis, knows just who is skimping on dinner to make the rent. And it's not always who you think. So nice of you to come in. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us here. Where do you start to describe the scope of the hunger or food insecurity problem in New York City? I think we start with just saying that it is probably bigger than your typical viewer probably would imagine. You know, it is a New York City issue, but it's also an American issue. I mean, there really are 46 million people in this country who are currently on food stamps. In New York City, there are three million people who are at risk, meaning that these are people who are right there at the edge um, of being very fearful about not being able to have enough food to feed themselves and their children. 1.5 million New Yorkers rely on soup kitchens and food pantries. 1.8 million New Yorkers are currently on food stamps. I mean, that is like one out of every, you know, six people, five, five people that you meet. I mean, that's a huge number. How so it's has not that changed during the Great Recession, let's say from 2008 until now? Significant increases. One of the major things that people need to remember is that before the recession, you could lose your job and it probably would take you, in a worst case scenario, about four months to find a new job. Right now, typically you should expect to wait about 10 months months before you find another job. So that means that even for everyone, the people who've been really smart with their money and they've saved and they've pulled things together, everyone should ask themselves, do you have enough money for 10 months to not have a new job, a new salary, income coming in every other week? Do you know the answer to the question that my previous guest didn't know the answer to and that is, what percentage of people on food stamps have jobs? In I New do. York. I don't know that number, but I will tell you that this concept that people have of, you know, the person who is homeless or the person who is, you know, just waiting on the check, that is not the case. Our member agencies, remember the food bank is serving in every borough, we're in almost every neighborhood, even for people who are at work, Brian, who may not know that there's a soup kitchen line or a food pantry line, because it typically is happening when most of us are at work. 
They may not know that, but what they should know is that there are a lot of people who work with you who race home to go to a pantry. There are a lot of New Yorkers who, because, as he did mention, because of the EBT card, can easily pull that out and they are purchasing groceries with the use of food stamps. Um, actually, I was just talking to one of our donors who was shocked to find out that, you know, major grocery stores, Whole Foods, Midtown, uh, um, Columbus Circles has one of the highest usages for food stamps, mm. period. The over $50,000 a month they bring in for food stamps. Many people think that, oh, I was actually looking on, I think it was on your website, and there were some, some of the viewers had made comments like, they should just go home and cook. You shouldn't be going in there buying all that prepared food. That's, that's not true. You cannot purchase anything. Like the other guest was saying, oh, it's just like a card. No, when you have your own credit card, you can pick anything you want. That's not, that's not how the benefits work. You actually have certain things you can get, certain things you cannot. One of the key things that people are buying with food stamps is produce, lots and lots of fruit, and certainly things like meat. Cereals, things of that nature. You can't get junk no food and anything like that. No prepared food. You cannot you can't not go into a restaurant and eat. No. You can't go into your local deli or bodega no. and get a sandwich from no. back there. Not with food stamps. You cannot. You cannot. Now, your organization did a study yes. that found that people uh, on food stamps sometimes earn as much as twice the poverty line, po mm -hmm. poverty rate, yeah. and still are eligible to food stamps yeah. or food stamps. Can you put the numbers on that? What is twice the poverty rate in the way that you measured it, and why would somebody making that much money be eligible? I'm trying to put it in the simplest terms, is that everyone should first remember, this is New York City. So when we talk about poverty, um, and we talk about a food stamp, you have to keep it in the context of how much it costs to live in this city. So we are not talking about, for food stamps, people who are making $60,000. We are not. We are often talking about people who are $20,000, maybe thirty. dollars but a lot of times also people who have children. So I think that your viewers just need to be able to understand that while we're talking about food stamps, we are also talking about a time where everything else, like salaries are not going up. The only thing that's going up is the cost to live here. So what, in all of our surveys, the thing that people kept coming back with is that what's gone up? The cost of food has gone up. The rent has gone up. Um, gas has gone up. I mean, it's all the things that you've always required just so, to survive. So when people apply for food stamps, mm -hmm. does the government look at the amount that they're having to pay in other basis, basic expenses? So if yeah. their rent is higher, mm -hmm then they're more likely to be approved for food stamps because the rent is taking a bigger percentage of their income? No, they're, they're, looking at, they're looking at your income, but one of the reasons why in New York City we are seeing really great success is because of all of these other things that would drive people into needing more assistance than maybe your typical person somewhere else. You know, when people look at poverty, they have to also remember, even when we talk about it nationally, urban poverty is very different from rural poverty. So you could see $40,000 in a rural area, and that person could be doing pretty well. You take that same money and try to put it inside of a city like New York City, and then add children to that same amount. And that person is truly struggling. And that has nothing to do with whether or not they went to college. It has nothing to do with whether or not they are a good tax-paying citizen. It has nothing to do with that. It's about all of the other expenses that are outside of their control. And your study also found more college students are receiving food stamps. What would account for that? Well, a college education, when you think about everything we ta we've talked about, it's kind of one of the reasons why I think so many people are really angry. People are angry because they're also scared. This economy has turned everything that we thought we knew on its head. It's just not, it's not what we were supposed to. If you go to college, you're going to be fine. If you are a, a nice person, you should be doing fine. Unfortunately, hunger does not discriminate. Sorry. It will hit anyone. It does not matter about race, gender. It does not matter about whether or not you went to college. If the jobs aren't there, the jobs aren't there. And so we don't want not people to choose hunger. people in college. I don't want to miss It's college educated. It's college educated. It is college people. educated. And I believe that number has actually increased by 40%.
in the past couple of years. I mean, that is, that is huge. And the reason why we, are, we were so excited to specifically look at that number, Brian, is because I do believe that hunger is still suffering from some really bad PR in the sense that maybe because it's a little comforting to believe that it's always someone else's issue. And that's just not the case. You know, no one wants to see themselves in that situation, but hunger is something that is experienced belly by belly. So I know the food bank uh, would not endorse any political candidates, but what did you make of Newt Gingrich calling Barack Obama the food stamps president? That was very unfortunate, uh, specifically because I know that he said it expecting, I mean, he, he, he hurled it as an insult. Um, he was obviously uh, trying to put something in people's head that makes it something that's uh, some negative something. But, you know, the food bank, we don't get involved in that because our thing is about hungry New Yorkers and people in need. What I would say for anyone who, whether they felt offended, whether they felt whatever about that silly comment, is that food, food stamps is a real benefit and it's something that is needed by more and more New Yorkers. And before people jump on that bandwagon, every one of us should understand you don't know which of your friends is currently feeding their children with food stamps. Let me tell you something. We talk about that 1.8 million and everybody's looking at who's on food stamps. The thing we all should care about is that half of that number is made of children. That is who's making up. I mean, children on food stamps. Well, really. let's hope that regardless of who is elected president exactly. this year, that job growth Absolutely. is uh, at a better pace than now and fewer people will need food stamps. Thank Absolutely. you very much for joining us and Thank for providing you. the services that you do. Thank you so much, Brian. Next up, the New York Public Library breaks the binding on two digital collections, old maps and old, old 3D stereographs. Stay with us. Today is Saturday. 60 minutes of physical activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. Get ideas. Get involved. Get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov. Let's move! Did you know that getting up and getting active for just 60 minutes a day is all it takes to help you get stronger, look better, and feel great? Or that fresh fruits and veggies aren't just healthier and crunchier. They can taste better, too. Eating better and getting more active is easier than you think. Yeah! Keep watching for some fun and easy ways to discover the magic of healthy living in your life. America, let's get healthy together. <laughs> Teaching a kid football is one thing. Keeping a kid in school, that's the name of my game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. The New York Public Library's map collection is one of the largest and richest in the world. A new tool called the NYPL Map Warper lets you not only see those maps in ways you haven't before, but also make your own mark on the collection. Here with us now to explain is Matt Knutson. He's the geospatial librarian at the NYPL and one of the people behind this project. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And when I come back in a future life, I want to have a title like <laughs> Geospatial Librarian. What does that mean? Uh, my position is primarily curatorial, but one of the things that I look out for on behalf of the library is other information, uh, maps, other, information other than, than maps that happens to be geospatial. So if you think about uh, city, an old city directory that's going to have uh, street addresses, or you think about old photographs, those are going to have locations that are associated with those things that happen to make them geospatial. So, geospatial maps plus. And what is map warping? I presume it is not that the maps got wet and developed <laughs> an unfortunate bend. Not, not, in, not in the physical world, but uh, in essence, uh, uh, war the warping term is, in, is the same sort of uh, concept, though, uh, but in, in the virtual world. So uh, we have a big collection of digitized maps we've been scanning for about 12 years. And the map warper allows anybody, anybody who creates an account on this particular website that we've built, uh, to create a new copy of these maps. So we have a, the scanned map, and then we have a virtual model of the Earth and we allow users to correlate locations on the ground 
uh, on the pixels of the old map to that particular latitude and longitude, be it a street intersection or a named place, and then create a de derivative copy which stretches. So if you think about the way that, uh, if you've ever looked at Google Earth, uh, you see it looks like a pastiche, kind of a patchwork of images that come together and create a mosaic of the world. Uh, we have a tool now that allows us to do that with historical maps. And we have a video of the kind of yep. map that you're talking about, and yep. this one happens to be of the neighborhood right around the New York Public Library main branch on 42nd Street. Yep. So we're going to roll this video and uh, you narrate it for us, okay? Okay. There it is. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a video we did for the centennial of this, uh, of the New York Public Library building that sits on 5th and 42nd Street. And the idea is to demonstrate what the map warper can do. Um, so we move through a chronology of old maps, starting with this one up on the wall here, which is a C chart done by Samuel Thornton in 1707. Um, and we move in and have our being John Malkovich type moment here and see that particular map having been warped and draped on top of uh, Google Earth. Um, we, we then move in scale. Also, we move forward in time to Sauthier's map of New York and New Jersey, these two provinces coming together. So you'll notice a theme. We're moving forward in time, and we're also moving forward in space. And the story of the, the place where the New York Public Library is located is being told. Here's now a map that shows the watershed as well as the, the Croton Aqueduct. And so we skim along the top of the Croton Aqueduct, moving down towards the New York Public Library. Um, and again, moving forward in time to this map, which shows a lot more than just the aqueduct, but also every street and a lot of the buildings uh, of the city. So this, this really is a demonstration video, a demonstration of the technology, as well as a demonstration of the, the ability for this stuff to show, uh, to tell stories. Um, so we are able to build models from building footprints that appear on maps. We're able to then do things like overlay photographic images and have another um, uh, another meta moment here where we zoom in and find ourselves in 1843 um, at the uh, Croton Reservoir um, um, demonstrating kind of the, the country nature of this place um, um, and also the showing off the, the richness in, uh, of the, the unique resources in the different types of collections we have the New York Public Library. Um, so these are maps that were warped, the ones you see on here, maps that were warped by um, public participants and um, um, this information was all compiled by a set of producers who, who put together this kind of nice video here. To, in essence, to show you what, what can be done. Um, we're building a model of the Crystal Palace, re, uh, Crystal Palace next to the Croton Reservoir. I get it. Yep. So it's a map that can be, uh, that engages in a time warp, basically. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. With all kinds of historical timeline elements. That's right. Uh, visually inserted in. That's right. And, and you said people have contributed to it, and this really is not just a professional's project, but a crowdsourcing project yeah. that you're hoping that members of the public contribute to. Talk more about that. That's right. Okay, so um, like I said, it's a web-based tool, um, and it allows users to come in to create accounts um, and uh, to do this work themselves. We've created a couple of training videos. We've worked really, really hard to make it so that the software itself is easier and easier to engage in, easier and easier to use, so that we have a, a, a much lower threshold for participation. Right now we have about 1,600 users. And what they can do is uh, either just watch a video and come in and train, or, or come in and train with somebody um, who, can, who teaches uh, workshops. We have uh, um, a dedicated staff member who does uh, uh, bi-weekly bi workshop on map warping. Um, so some of the really, really most um, um, successful uh, groups that we've had coming in um, have been what I like to call kind of targeted crowdsourcing. So um, in particular, there's a university group that has a cross-listed community service and computer science class. And every semester for about the past three years, they've uh, helped us do uh, whole ton of map warping um, and in addition to that they've helped us trace a lot of historical map information um, which will then become part of a, of a larger um, uh, database. Let, let's um, show another one of your projects. Sure, okay. Yeah. So narrate us through this. Okay. This is a uh, map warping of New York Harbor. Okay. 
on Nicholas Vischer's map of uh, Novi Belgi, it's called at that point. Um, we're moving into one of the earliest maps that depicts Manhattan Island. Um, straight in, uh, and again, the concept is, is very similar here. Um, we have a lot of historical maps. We warp them in order to, uh, to create a, a, a normalized version of historical geography as it's expressed through these different maps. Um, <clears throat> and we can see uh, here Jamaica Bay and all of the transformations that um, have taken place to these natural wetlands over time. Um, uh, again, this is a, uh, a wonderful way to display a huge variety of different types of documents. This is a government document here. This is a coast and geodetic survey map of the channel. Um, and you can see this is uh, contemporarily known as Broad Channel. Um, this is really one of my favorite maps from the video. Um, this is a, a map of, of Sandy Hook at the harbor. Um, you can see once this map fades out the degree to which um, Sandy Hook has changed. All of this, all of this new land has been added here. Um, uh, these maps are a really, really great way of indicating change over time. I mean, and that's one of the, the, the most powerful, I think, metaphors that comes out through map warping. It's really fabulous. So how do viewers participate if they want to? If you want to participate in map warping, you can do one of two things. You can contact us uh, through our Twitter handle. Uh, you can send us a direct message at, at NYPLMaps or you can go directly to the website and just sign up for an account, and that's maps.nypl.org. Great stuff. Thank you for coming in. Okay, thanks, Brian. After the break, the New York Public Library will show us yet again that nothing is new under the sun with 3D, 1800 style. Ma, guess what? I went back to college. No, I didn't quit my job. I'm finishing my degree with a CUNY online bachelor's in business. I interact online with real City University of New York faculty on a schedule that fits my busy life. Ma, you should look who's teaching at CUNY. And it all leads to a high quality Bachelor of Science degree in business. I can attend class anywhere, anytime. Yes, Mom, even at your house Friday night for dinner. The CUNY Online Baccalaureate. Get back to business. Welcome to the Solar Generation Road Trip. If you want to know how solar energy is working for America, you have to go out and ask America. We're talking to people from coast to coast who are using solar power every day. From a few panels on a homeowner's roof to large solar plants with enough utility power for a whole town. Solar energy is working for America now, saving us money, creating new jobs, and giving our world a brighter future. Go solar! Welcome to the solar generation. Into each life, a little rain must fall. And what rains on our cities flows into what we drink. The Arbor Day Foundation invites you to plant trees in your community so the water that flows into our rivers and streams will be clean and safe. Visit arborday.org to find out how to plant the right trees in the right place and support Tree City USA where you live. Go to arborday.org. Crack Closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. There we go. We're seeing more and more movies coming out in 3D these days. Innovative? No. 3D imagery goes back to the 19th century with the invention of stereographs, those cards with photos on them that you insert into a viewer to create a 3D image. Well, the New York Public Library has a collection of more than 72,000 stereographs, and they inspired artist Joshua Heinemann to create animated, digitized versions. His work led the library to create a tool called the Stereogranimator that lets anyone do the same. Joshua is here with us now via Skype from San Francisco, and Ben Vershbo of New York Public Library Labs joins us in the studio. Hello. Hi. Good to, good to be here. And uh, we'll get that San Francisco guest up in just a minute. Tell us, first of all, um, what a stereograph is for people who've never seen one. Well, a stereograph, you may have seen one without realizing uh, that you saw one. Uh, they're, they're 
old photographs that are in doubled pairs, that are on a single card. And what they're essentially doing is, is kind of mimicking the effect of binocular vision, the way that the eye sees two slightly different images. Uh, and there's a little bit of overlap, uh, or there's a little bit at each edge that is not in the field of the other eye. And what the stereograph does, uh, through the use of a stereoscope, which is a viewing device where you essentially put the card in with a, with a magnifying lens and then can move it to get the right focus, uh, it allows you to resolve those two images into one image, the way that your eye does with everything it sees every moment of your, of your viewing life, into a 3D immersive image. So it's like what some people had as toys, as kids, those view masters or viewfinders? View masters were very much a, a kind of an evolution of that technology. And, and for about the better part of a century, stereographs were, they weren't, they weren't marginal. They were actually a, 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 a predominant form of popular photography and were kind of the cutting edge of 3D immersive experience. So now let's bring in Josh from San Francisco and plunge right into an example of his work. First of all, hello from New York. Thank you for coming on with us. Hello, thanks for having me. And we're going to put up an image of uh, one of your pieces called City Folks on the Promenade. The original image is from the 1800s. So um, tell us what exactly we're seeing here. Well, uh, I mean, this is a stereograph that, as uh, Ben said, I pulled from the archive. And so, I mean, the thing that struck me about this specific picture is just that the way that the bridge sort of draws back and these people are sort of walking, it's, it's such a common sight, you know, you, you'd see that now, but that's like a hundred years old, you know? And so it just kind of, um, I, made a, I made thousands of those things, but that was one of the first ones I put up because you know, I just thought it was really striking. Why is it shimmying like that? It's shimmying so that you see in 3D. Uh, it's kind of a trick. Uh, it's it's if if you if you if it wasn't shimmy and you wouldn't be having that parallax effect and you wouldn't be seeing any 3D whatsoever. Um, it's a shallower form of 3D than you than you might see uh, if you were using an actual stereoscope and and maybe Ben explain that. But basically, it shimmies as a sort of a trick just so you don't need anything. It's it's there. It's on the screen and it's uh, accessible. So let's go to another one. Um, this is another piece called Uncle taps a sugar maple and I have this as from 1892 I don't know how accurate that is but let's take a look now what of this is yours because you're an artist who works okay. with these images and what of this is the same thing that somebody would have seen in the uh, 1800s yeah well that's that's actually a really good question so basically uh, the only thing that's mine is that I was the one who used these pictures that the New York Public Library had. Okay, they had these pictures there. You can't see them in the way that it would have been. And I just happened to be the one who thought it would be interesting to put these together and sort of curate them and put them up on my own website. And then a lot of people found them and started, you know, just being interested in it. So basically the only thing that's mine is that I took two pictures, layered them on top of each other, and I'm flickering at a certain rate that sort of tricks your brain into thinking you're seeing it in 3D. If you had been looking through a stereoscope, that wouldn't be moving, of course. So my addition to that is just to make it view online, basically. So Ben, how did the New York Public Library hear about Josh, and what did you do to get him involved in the library and the library involved in this. Sure, well, yeah, so uh, we were among the many people who were stumbling upon Josh's work, and um, uh, partly because Josh was very, uh, very dutifully linking back to the source. He was linking back to, to our digital gallery, which is a large open access uh, web repository of, of freely available images from our collections that we've digitized over the years. And so he was linking back to the source record, and that was a way, it was a way of effectively pinging us, letting us know, hey, I'm doing something with your, with your collections. And we were delighted to see that he was essentially remixing them, um, kind of finding a, a clever way of conjuring that kind of immersive 3D effect where you're sort of slightly seeing around objects so that you have that depth into the image, uh, which is very much unlike you know, a, a normal 2D image. Um, but using actually an old, tr an old trope of the web, which is the animated GIF, which is essentially an image file that is looping between uh, two or more images. And these have been around since the earliest days of the web. Um, 
when people were putting little flickering icons on their web pages saying, under construction, a little guy digging. Uh, they're like little mini movies, almost little mini animations. And they're, they work in any browser. They've been, they're just, they're durable. They last. They work in your phone. They, they're a very hardy form of internet folk art. And this kind of mashup of the animated GIF with the stereograph was very compelling to us. So we would point the, to this a lot as one of the cool examples of here's the kind of things that can happen when we actually put collections online in forms so of So let's can... go to your website sure. and uh, tell us what we're seeing here as people take a look at how this actually looks. There you go. Um, so, so we built a site that is directly inspired from, from Joshua's work where essentially we built a tool where right in the browser you can select an image from our collections and produce the same effect that, that Joshua produced with uh, a more sophisticated process involving Photoshop and cropping an image and actually kind of tweaking it uh, and playing with some of the color correction. Uh, this allows you to select an image and then drag two, uh, we're not gonna be able to demo it right now, but drag two squares around the two halves. This is the, the, the tool before you've actually started engaging with it. But essentially what you do with your mouse, you, you click one of those squares, you move it around, they move in sync, you can crop them down and you get a live preview on the right. And, uh, it, and once you get it in that kind of sweet spot where the wiggle is there but not so, so pronounced that you're getting a kind of a seizure, uh, where it's kind of just that little almost cinematic loop, uh, you can hit save and it'll become a new creation and you can then share that on social media. There's another setting too, I should add, uh, where you can also produce uh, what are called anaglyph images. And those are, you've seen those before, I'm sure, the red-blue tinted images that with the kind of your old school 3D glasses with one red lens and one blue lens will resolve into an actual 3D image. So we're, we're, we've added a new component to the project, uh, but essentially have allowed anyone and, and everyone to come and participate in this and create, uh, you know, a, theoretically an infinite number of variations out of these original photographs. Cool. So Josh, uh, how early, as far as you could tell, was this going on? Yeah, the, the practice of actually putting together sort of uh, animated GIF stereographs. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I started in 2008 probably. Um, I started, actually, I probably started before 2008, but 2008 is when I started putting them on my website. And um, Right, I guess I meant, Ben, maybe you know, uh, because you're with the library, how far back into the 1800s. Ah. this practice goes? Uh, you know, I'd have to do a little more research to find the precise, the invention of the stereograph, but they really became popular around the 18, early 1850s. Right, and, so and, early. And, there and was went, barely photography at that time. Right, uh, so, and they, and so... And, and you know, we're still debating 3D today. Exactly, and, it, and this, so this, one of the, our motives with this, ex, with this project, and uh, one of the reasons that Joshua's work caught our eye, beyond just the kind of the beautiful, beautiful effect he created with the images, um, was that it really opened up an interesting conversation between you know, our persistent fascination with 3D and immersive entertainment and, um, and with the roots of that, of that effect. One more quick example before we gotta go. Let's take a look. I think this is gonna be gold miners. No, oh. <laughs> no, what it, Ben, uh, tell us. Or Josh, can you see what we're showing? These are shipwrecked people. Uh, they're <laughs> shipwrecked on, the on some coffee cargo. I just think this image is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I found this in the archive and I, I, I put it up. This is again one of the first probably that I put up. But these people are shipwrecked in Massachusetts and they're hiding from the sun and I guess waiting for help. I, I, just, I just find it a really, really compelling little scene. Last word? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just think these things, they continue. Uh, I, I still am kind of... Um, enchanted by these images, uh, whether they're created by Joshua or now by these thousands and thousands of users who have now, in just the last few days, produced uh, almost 14,000 uh, kind of derivative artworks off of these collections, and we expect to keep going with that and improving the site. Uh, they have just such a, they just sort of just barely come to life. They kind of twitch in front of your eyes in a way that is very suggestive and really lifts them off of the 2D kind of flat surface that we've offered them in the past. So well, I'm really excited about this. Great stuff. Thank you both for joining Thank us. Thank you. Up next, a new high school will train programmers for New York City's burgeoning tech scene. Ma, guess what? I went back to college. No, I didn't quit my job. I'm finishing my degree with a CUNY online bachelor's in business. I interact online with real City University of New York faculty on a schedule that fits my busy life. Ma, you should look who's teaching at CUNY. And it all leads to a high quality Bachelor of Science degree in business. I can attend class anywhere, anytime. <sighs> yes, mom, even at your house Friday night for dinner. The CUNY Online Baccalaureate. Get back to business.
Welcome to the Solar Generation Road Trip. If you want to know how solar energy is working for America, you have to go out and ask America. We're talking to people from coast to coast who are using solar power every day. From a few panels on a homeowner's roof to large solar plants with enough utility power for a whole town. Solar energy is working for America now, saving us money, creating new jobs, and giving our world a brighter future. Go solar! Welcome to the solar generation. Into each life, a little rain must fall. And what rains on our cities flows into what we drink. The Arbor Day Foundation invites you to plant trees in your community. So the water that flows into our rivers and streams will be clean and safe. Visit arborday.org to find out how to plant the right trees in the right place. And support Tree City USA where you live. Go to arborday.org. Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. New York's tech scene is booming. Companies like Foursquare, Tumblr, Kickstarter, and hundreds of others were born here and are thriving. There's a nagging problem, though, a lack of skilled programmers to create the innovative software that powers these companies. The new Cornell Technion campus that will be built on Roosevelt Island could help, but a local high school teacher and a venture capitalist wanted to go deeper and train New York City school kids to be the tech innovators of the future. They came up with an idea for a public high school called the Academy for Software Engineering. And now their idea is coming to fruition. The new school will open this fall. Fred Wilson, managing partner of Union Square Ventures, and Mike Zemanski, who teaches programming at Stuyvesant High School, are with us now to explain their brainchild. Also with us, Josh Thomasis, the Deputy Chief Academic Officer for the New York City Department of Education. Welcome to all of you. Fred is joining us on the phone, by the way. Uh, but Mike, let me start with you. Talk about this idea. Well, um, I've been teaching computer science at Stuyvesant since, well, forever. Um, and I've been trying to develop this program. And it, it's tough getting something new going in a New York City public school. So over the years, uh, we're trying to gain traction, trying to gain traction. Our graduates are going off. They're working at Google. They're working at, well, you name it, they're there. Um, but it's been a tough, low road, a tough, very long road. A couple of years ago, I heard from a couple of my alums, a couple of my graduates, and they said, hey, Z, you've got to check out Fred Wilson's blog. Uh, Fred had just uh, blogged about education, uh, programming, computer science, and education. Um, they ultimately put the two of us together, and um, now we're here. So, Fred, for you as a venture capitalist, what's the point here? This is a New York City public school program. This is not something that you're investing in, presumably to make money in a direct fashion, correct? That's true, but, you know, the, the reality is that there's not enough uh, well-trained software engineers uh, anywhere in, in the United States, maybe anywhere in the world, but certainly not in New York City. And... You know, this is a long-term investment. This is about um, trying to get the ball rolling and start teaching more students, more high school students, the uh, fundamental skills of software engineering. And my hope is that this is just the start, that other people will see this initiative and say, hey, we like what that, what's going on there and we want to do it. Maybe people in other cities see what's going on and they want to copy it. Or maybe other high schools in New York City say, hey, you know, we want to adopt some of the curriculum or... Uh, you know, in the same way that I was inspired by what Mike did at Stuyvesant um, to help get this going, maybe somebody at, at another school will look at this and speak, in New York City will look at this and say, hey, we want to adopt some of those classes and some of that curriculum. So this is just about trying to get more software engineers at the end of the day, which is a, uh, a talent that's in very short supply. So, Josh, is this where you come in, that you're hoping to use this as a prototype for citywide tech education? 
Absolutely. When, uh, when Fred came to us and said he'd been to Mike's classroom and seen what was possible there, he said, so what's the strategy for, for going citywide? And what I put out to him there is, is you start by doing it in one school. You figure out how to do it well. You build the whole scope and sequence, building off what's done there. Um, and then my commitment to him was, having learned on that, we would figure out how to broaden that to other career and technical education schools and other schools in the city. So it started at Stuyvesant which is, you know, the elite of the elite schools in New York City, and now you're starting a whole high school that's built around this as a theme? Uh, that's the first step, or the next step, if you will. Next yeah. step, because it opens <laughs> in September, right? <laughs> so, so if I may, Brian, we're, we're, Mike stays at Stuyvesant. We're lucky to have him there, and his kids are lucky to have him there. We're now working with Fred uh, and, and others to, to find the right leader and to go ahead and open uh -huh. this September. And We're, it's not a selective school in the sense that Stuyvesant is, It right? is not a selective school. It, we are working uh, to attract the broadest range of students um, and to attract those who are passionate uh, and excited about computers, who can think uh, on their feet and uh, learn programming code. So where will it be, physically? Can I, can I interrupt you, there for a second? Yeah, f uh, Fred, go ahead. So it's, it's not a selective school. It's open to any, any students in New York City. You don't have to pass a test to go to school. But we're going to be very clear with uh, students who are interested that they, they can't be slackers in the school. That, you know, what I said is they've got to be hackers, not slackers. They gotta, they're going to have to work really hard. They're going to have to phone up on their math. They're going to have to phone up on you know, reasoning and logic. And, and, and they're going to have to work probably harder than they would work um, almost anywhere else in high school. But in return for that, they're going to graduate with a, a skill set that, um, you know, few have, and they're going to be, you know, uh, headed off to a very bright future. Fred couldn't be more right. So It's opening in Union Square, in Union, uh, Washington in Union. Irving campus. Okay. Uh, so there's a career and technical education mm -hmm. course of study. Does that mean it will be for some students who don't plan to go on to college as well as some who do? Well, what we've articulated with the advisory board is a goal to have all students on track uh, to college, um, that there will be some who go straight into industry, either because they found roles or because, frankly, they're, they're that talented at the work, and there are others that will go on um, to, to four-year programs and beyond. Um, there will be a CT certification at the school in programming code, like in Java or Ruby or others. And, Fred, does that kind of go to the scope of help that's needed at New York startups? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, any specific language can be learned. If you're a good programmer, you know, and you know Java, you can learn Ruby, or if you know Ruby, you can learn um, JavaScript or whatever. So the thing we're trying to do is develop the fundamentals, and that's where Mike's program is really an inspiration. He starts the kids out with the basics, and he really grinds into them the fundamentals of, of computer science and software engineering. And once they have that, learning any individual language is really not a big deal. It's, uh, it's about how to think about programming a computer and, and how to do it well with you know, discipline and, and all that. And so that's really what we're going to try to do here as well. And I'm certain that the kids who come out of school, whether they go on to college or go right into the workforce, are going to get great jobs and they're going to, and they're going to be helpful to the tech community in New York. So is one of your goals as a venture capitalist who's getting involved with this to be kind of a broker between some of the companies that might want these students as interns or some of the students who might want some people from those companies as mentors, anything like that? Well, what we're going to hopefully have is an internship program. We've got an advisory board for the school that has people from Facebook and Google and Twitter and eBay and... Foursquare and Etsy and Tumblr and Kickstarter. So we already have the connection being built to the uh, high-tech companies, and hopefully there'll be internships when these students get far enough along in their in their work that they can actually uh, um, uh, that they can actually do this work. Sorry about this. Um, if they can actually do this work, then um, I think it's uh, I think it's the um, uh, you know, the natural, uh, I won't be a broker, but there'll be natural opportunities for them to find work in these companies. 
And if I may, I mean, this is really what the mayor was talking about in the state of the city around what we're so excited about partnership partnering with private industry and building these kinds of uh, advisory boards to support our career and technical education work uh, and to support the development of internship, internships and opportunities for kids across the city. Mike, do you think a school like this can provide a well-rounded education? Are people going to come out as just sort of tech geeks with perhaps a very marketable skill, or are they going to know humanities, are they going to know literature, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, well, first, uh, I've always been a big believer in a liberal education um, and not just a purely technical one. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be a small school and it does have a focus, as all of these new schools do have, but all of the schools have uh, English programs, history programs, and I think this school has to, I think one of our charges is each of those programs have to be amongst the best. Um, one of the things that makes my current students so uh, so marketable, if you would, is they're not just blinder on tech geeks, but they know how to think. And part of knowing how to think is not just knowing how to think like a computer scientist. It's also about how to think like a historian, how to think like a biologist, how to think like an author, how to think like a journalist, and bringing all these tools to bear. So if this school is going to work, it has to do everything well. Josh, how about diversity? I could imagine this school winding up 85% male? Well, we've seen some national research on it and we're paying attention to the challenge. Um, I think uh, Fred talked about attracting kids and figuring out how to really attract a broad range of students and we're going to figure out how to attract uh, uh, young women as well. Um, if I could actually uh, <coughs> say something about this, uh, prior to having a required computer science course at Stuyvesant, um, it, the classes were all very male dominated. Um, as soon as we got the girls into the classroom through a required course, the balance shifted and it's, it's much closer to the balance of the school. And every year I get a number of young ladies who come into my office, some were my students, some were my colleagues' students, and saying, hey, Mr. Z, thanks, why? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm going off to Stanford, I'm going off to CMU, I'm majoring in computer science, and if I didn't start out in that required course, I never would have thought of it. Once we get the girls into the classroom, they can do it, and that's with any group. Once we get them in, they'll say, hey, this is neat stuff. Well, this is very exciting. Congratulations on the new school. Congratulations on having the idea and partnering with Fred. We'll see how this works out starting in the fall. Congratulations. And Fred, thanks a lot for joining us on the phone. I know you're at uh, your, uh, your son's basketball game, and that's the noise we were hearing in the background. Just remind them to uh, drop back on defense, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. And that's it for this week's show. We roll out a new episode Wednesday nights at 7.30 or see us anytime at CUNY.TV and check out my daily radio show weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC. Tomorrow morning, parenting styles from around the world. That's on 93.9 FM and AMA 20 WNYC. Talk to you then.